When school let out each summer, Fred Wong, who worked as a teacher, would travel to Alaska to work in the salmon canning industry. One season in Ketchikan, and 53 seasons on Kodiak Island. From 1953, when he was a high school student, until 2008, at the age of 73. So that's a record for any canner worker. It's around the clock. Eat, sleep, go to work. Wong grew up in Portland, Oregon's Chinatown. I'm ABC, American-born Chinese. I'm a veteran, as, as a matter of fact. He worked his way up the ranks at the Alatak cannery from fish processor to cannery foreman at a time when there weren't many Chinese cannery workers. But just a few decades earlier, roughly three to 5,000 Chinese people worked in Alaska's canneries each year, representing a significant portion of the workforce. Economic and political conditions in China in the 1800s led thousands of people to journey across the Pacific. By the 1870s, commercial salmon fisheries emerged and Chinese contractors would pack boats, nicknamed hell ships, with laborers bound for West Coast and Alaska canneries. They'd work the season with laborers from around the world and also indigenous to Alaska. That dock was as cosmopolitan as, as Los Angeles. You look at one cannery and it just telescopes out and you have world history and all of 19th century, 20th century history going on right there. Katie Ringsmith, also a former cannery worker, is the director of the NN Cannery History Project. 1878 to 1879, they're bringing up a Chinese workforce. So the, the Chinese workers were there from the very beginning. They're moving across. They're going from southeast to Cook Inlet, you know, right there on the Kenai. Then they're going to Kodiak. And then ultimately, they're in Bristol Bay by 1883, and they're bringing, importing the Chinese laborers to do every element of that work. Across the country, competition for jobs led to anti-Chinese racism. And that's when the nation's first major race-based discriminatory immigration law was passed. Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, and then they make it permanent 10 years later. And so all of these Chinese uh, have the choice of either staying or going home, and no one can come back in. In 1903, as Chinese people were barred from entering the U.S., they were being replaced by a machine. The invention of the iron chink was a major advance. This head chopping was once done by Chinese labor. You know, back in 1900, you're Chinese, you're nothing. That's why they call it that. As the existing Chinese cannery workers aged out, they were replaced by Mexican, Puerto Rican, Black, Japanese, Pacific Islander, and Filipino laborers, each with their own unique story of arrival to the American West and North. The bunkhouse and graveyard at the Diamond NN Cannery in South Naknek are some of the few indicators that Chinese laborers were once here. What is lacking is uh, some of the personal stories about Chinese workers. In the 70s, James Chow, his twin brother Philip, and a couple other international students from Taiwan landed their first cannery job in Alaska. I did not know any of this history when I was there. I only learned it after I retired six years ago when I started studying the history of the canneries. Now on their website, the Chow brothers have helped document some of the stories of Chinese cannery workers, including Fred Wong's story. Every group come to America has its own struggle. It is when we put all these top stories together, it became the American story. So I think if we all understand this situation, I think we'll be able to tolerate each other better. And hopefully, you know, future, you know, to prevent uh, the type of uh, uh, anti-Chinese, anti-Asian, or those type of uh, uh, extreme uh, violence uh, in the future. James Chow, Fred Wong, and Katie Ringsmith each aim to share the stories of the essential workers that put food on the table, and to this day, bring Alaska's wild salmon to the rest of the world. I like a coho better. I just had some last night. For Alaska Public Media, I'm Jeff Chen.